All right, Campbell's comments now going to, for a little bit of international content um, over the next few months when it gets winter time here, especially in, in the US and Europe where things start to hot up. Timmy Petrick's joining me firstly. Uh, firstly, Timmy, thank you for joining me. No, absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. Um, I really do appreciate it. I'll try and break down some of the barriers, if you like, of um, uh, harness racing right across the world. And I think um, you know, we need to open our eyes to so many things. There's so many parts of this I do want to talk to you uh, about. But um, you're a driver in the industry. You have a dead set love of harness racing, though, don't you? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I love horse racing. I love the horses and watching them uh, grow and get better and, you know, make it from when they're babies all the way till uh, – they're performing on this big stage where they get to race for big money. Where did that start? Like, how did it, how did, how did it start for you in the racing game? Uh, family business. My father raced horses way before I was even thought of. My grandfather got involved in harness racing, and we had a farm there in southern Illinois. And, you know, it was a family operation. My dad never had an owner and put three kids through school. Never uh, owned, trained, drove, shod, did the vet work. We did everything, you know, and, I, I still to this day think he had three kids for free help. You know, that's, that was part of the reason why he had three kids. You know? Yeah. But he obviously loved the game and loved you guys as well. Oh yeah. And, and he worked hard. You know, he, he, he never had a payment, never had a truck payment, never, um, you know, he shot his, learned how to shoe his own horses by himself, learned uh, how to treat everything and take care of them. And, you know, he's a full-time horseman. He went over a thousand races training and over 1500 went drives as a driver you know and so he was a full-time horseman yeah um i suppose you keep probably reflecting back on that from time to time everything you've achieved but I, i'd imagine what dad was able to do with your kids probably grounds you a little bit oh big time uh, if it wasn't for his teaching and um teaching me how to uh manage a horse um keeping them you know always exceeding to get better and um trying to make them better without hurting them and you know, making them grow and uh, giving them time to grow on the racetrack. That was always very important for my father. Do you do you enjoy the training side of things? I know you don't train yeah. in your own, own right. But I, you... I miss it. I miss it, yeah, because I miss having that time in the barn. Um, I would just, just soon clean 10 stalls and, you know, hang out with the horses and mess with them than go jog 10 horses. You know, I, I see enough horses racing every day. You know, there was a time when I loved – I didn't want to be in the barn, but – you know, like I get to help my daughters out now. They have barrel. My daughter has a barrel horse. My wife has barrel horses. And I bring a few of my race horses home that I own just to turn them out and rehab them. And um, it's fun to get to hang out with them. You know, I, I only get to see them for one or two minutes, you know, per week, you know, when they get to race. And when you see them every day, you get to feed them and watch them react to everything. It's pretty cool. Does that help you, you reckon, when you go back to the racetrack, um, maybe knowing a little bit more about each horse? Well, I don't know about knowing more about them, but get your mind off the everyday grind. Um, you know, just going out there and trying to compete to win. You know, like, you know, you do respect the grooms more um, when that horse doesn't race as good as it should. You might come off and say, hey, listen, it didn't go good, but next time we'll get him. Instead of saying, well, this thing's a piece of crap, you know, don't put me up no more. But, you know, yeah, I, I respect the grooms, and I, I know it's uh, – when you race 20 horses a day, it's hard to have that great attitude and say, oh, you did a great job. But, you know, it does it gives me a little more realization about that. How often a week do you drive? What's that? How often a week do you drive? Well, this year, I've, it's probably my slowest year ever. But in the years, the last 20 years, it's six, seven days a week. Um, you know, I might get 10 days off a year, you know. But uh, this year, I've taken more time and. Um, a lot of the tracks have slowed, backed up the dates and stuff. So this is the slowest year I've ever had. Is that like, are you happy with that? Or would you be happy being busy or? Well, both. I like the money coming in. Um, I like, you know, get to spend more time with my family. Um, but yeah, just the way it's working right. I'm 42 now and things have changed. When I first started this, I wanted to race 10 times a day in every track I could. And, um, I've done that and I've raced a lot of horses. I raced over you know, 60,000 horses in the last 20 years. So, you know, you can only do so much so many times. Just just on that, was, there was a post up the other day, and I don't know if it's an old – I'm not 100% sure about it. Youngest driver to have $200 million in earnings, but then underneath it, it had 2018. What was – was that an old poster or is that something new? 
No, I, I, I made 200 million in 2018. That's when I broke the 200 million mark. So, right. How come did that poster just come back up the other day? Ah, I'm sure it was just a pop up just to make, to make me feel good about myself. So uh, I'm not sure why it come up, but that was what it was. Yeah. Do you know where you're at at the minute with earnings? Uh, 270, 268, two, or close to 270. It's an amazing number. A lot of the Aussies won't be able to, to do that. You say about your kids and your wife do barrel racing um, and that, and some of the photos, like I love your social media content. I'd like people that embrace the industry, if you like, and showcase different parts of it. You've got a barn. Um, that horse riding and that side of things is something pretty important to you, I, I believe, anyway, because quite often you see you walking around with the horses and, and your wife and um, even your mother, a photo of her on Mother's Day the other day. Um, that seems a pretty important outreach to you, I suppose. It does, absolutely. You know, and I like doing the, the grunt work, getting make sure the arena's dug up. I like buying the new tractor and the new drags and stuff to make the arena look really nice and neat. And we've got a little quarter mile sand track here that the girls can ride on. And when I do bring a horse home here or two, once in a while, I'll jog them in the deep sand and get them legged up for a little bit before I send them back to the, the real trainers. But, you know, just little things that I like to do. And it gets my mind off that everyday grind of going to work you know going driving horses all the time do you do you ride them do you go riding oh i ride some yeah i like to rope you know we uh we have some rope horses here and well um, me and the wife and trista will get the get the fake calf in behind the the four-wheeler and they'll pull it we'll rope it and we'll have a good old time in the afternoon sometimes i like that because i think you know a lot of people over here get too immersed if you like in the industry um and all they do is eat breathe harness racing work harness horses all day and uh yeah watch races all night and it, it can get too much sometimes it, it can get on your brain you know especially when you let it conceive you and let you uh take over the business and let your that's all you think about you got to have things to get your mind off of it uh, that way you can come by, back and have a fresher look at it sometimes the, the, the social media i want to talk about the racing in a sec to me but the social media aspects of uh, tea trick racing um it seems very very important and anyone who doesn't follow i encourage them to go follow you got sixty thousand followers i think um last i checked um which is amazing but you'll share anything and everything that has some relevance to you like do you actually control that or does someone else do it for you mostly my wife does it and she is uh she's a saint for keeping up on it um i know how to turn it turn on get on Facebook or social media and check it. But uh, my wife does it. And she has one person that helps her a lot with it. But mainly it's my wife. She does most of that. She loves the sport. She's a USGA director. And, you know, she's trying to grow it any way she can. You know, that's what she went to school for marketing and sales and stuff. And, you know, she's good at what she does. And, you know, she's really uh, made a lot of followers and people like it. And they they, they want to be part of it. Uh, and the thing I, I love, like um... – one of you shared the other day, Jet Turnbull drove his 100 winners um, in Australia within a year. Um, it's a record over here. He's a young man. You shared another one from Dubbo. Actually, both of those were from Dubbo um, with Wendy Wendy Turnbull having a uh, dead heat with stay, mm -hmm. with uh, brothers and sisters driving them. You, you'll touch on the Australian stuff. A young girl won her first race in Newcastle, not from a harness racing family. Things, things like that are what we need to keep embracing and and showcase. i think anything in the sport of harness racing it's worldwide and i don't think people really realize that the australians the new zealands americans sweet wherever you're from they, it's worldwide you, there's horse racing in um you know puerto rico and you know they race them up down the road harness races you know um horse racing harness racing is a worldwide sport you know we just for some reason we haven't let it grow like some of the other sports have but you know, I love the sport and I hope other people learn to love it too. Did you, like you're saying before with dad um, and how he started you off um, in the industry, whether he meant to or not, but I mean, just his hard work ethic and, uh, you know, shoeing horses, working horses, grooming horses, doing everything himself, driving the trucks himself to get them to the races. And it, is that where you maybe saw, geez, we've got to be able to keep doing this better and different to be able to grow the sport? Is that like a little bit of the grounding that you had from your dad makes you think a bit differently about how to promote it? You know, just my dad taught me hard work and hard work usually pays off. And um, any Anybody in any business thinks it's just going to be handed to you, whether you're a track owner or you're a, you work for IBM or you work for PNC Bank. You know, if you think it's just going to be handed to you, you're wrong. You know, you got to go out and get it. You got to chase it. And 
find a way to get people interested into it or get more business to brought into you. So, you know, that's our theory on it. Hard work usually pays off. Yeah, it's uh, I think it's a, it's a a great way to look at it. And I think try and leave the game in a better way than what you you found it is uh, so, you know, something I, I'm I love sure the sport. The sport has given me, you know, if, I, mean, I swear if it wasn't for horse racing and being able to be involved in horses, I'd be a Walmart greeter, or, you know, st- stacking shelves somewhere because uh, I'm not much good at anything else. So I'm thank God for horses. <laughs> I can imagine you doing that. Um, with the social media, you've got this great association with Nikolai Jockey. Um, how did that start? You've got a great friendship um, here, but how, how did a, just, this t- t- tall basketballer reach out to you? <laughs> you know, it just kind of fell into place. Um, I didn't know there was ever horse racing in Serbia. Did you know there was horse racing in Serbia? Uh, only because of, of Nikolai. Okay, so but I didn't until I met him and – you know, he, he just, he was over here in the States and he really didn't know much about American harness racing. Um, he knew there was some there, but he didn't know anybody. And, you know, through, through a few people and the social media, and we kind of got connected. Uh, I think he messaged me one day and then we just started talking and he goes, listen, I'm going to be in New York city area in like four weeks. I need a fix. I want to go see some horses. And he, I said, I'll set you up, man. No worries. And he, after that, he, he was so thankful and so happy. And, you know, we've created a friendship over that. And, you know, he's, uh, he's, I consider him a friend. We can talk about anything but basketball with him. And I don't want to talk about horses. So it's kind of a hard to talk all the time, but you know, he's uh he's a great guy. Do you have a love of basketball? I love basketball. I grew up in the Michael Jordan era. I'm, yeah. I'm from Illinois. Um, I grew up watching Scotty Pippen, Michael Jordan, you know, they win six championships there really quick. And, um, yeah, I grew up playing basketball in high school and grade school. I always loved it. And, you know, that, that was my sport. Don't forget the great Aussie Luke Longley as well. He was part of that. Era. Oh, Luke. Yeah. Luke was there. Absolutely. Yeah. Big um, seven footer with red hair. You know, you gotta like that. <laughs> <red hair. laughs> I looked after you there and another passionate person. What will Nikolai what will he do for the industry going forward? Like, I mean, right at the minute, we see all these posts of him uh, playing leap basketball, finishing, got his phone going, watching a race, uh, you know, anywhere in the world, I think, by the looks of uh, what it will. But, I mean, his career is going to come to an end. But to me, it looks like he's going to continue to promote our industry, which is something we need to be able to embrace. Well, I, like, if anybody watches much of the basketball, they've seen when he won the championship last year, he had no idea there was a parade in two days. He was planning on leaving that next morning to go home to be at his farm in Serbia and play with his horses. He wanted to get home, be back with his family. He was he was honestly distraught about there was a parade. He made a joke about it and he's like, Parade, what parade? You know, like he, he had planned on get he had no idea there was a parade. You know, and he stayed and had a great he said, I love it, it's a great parade. Um, but you know, for him, he, he was so excited to get to go home and see his friends, see his family where he grew up and have a good time. Yeah. And that's, it's cool. It's cool for our, our industry and Serbian harness racing. And um, you can watch it. Any of the Australians watching on a Sunday, I got a heap of likes at uh, links on YouTube's and it's one I found, but it, there is Russian, Russian harness race. The track's sensational. It looks about it. Yeah. It different. looks like it. Yeah. Big crowds. Yeah. They have a good turnout, which the only race one day a week on a Sunday or you know, it's one day a week, but you know, that I think maybe that's partly our problem. We just race too much. You know, we race so much and you know, uh, yeah, I mean, we race a lot of races here in the United States, same as in Australia, you know, there's a lot of racing. But. Yeah. It's one of the things that you know, gets groundhog day, doesn't it? Over and over. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 That's with And we race it. every, ho- we race every holiday, you know, it's, you know, there's no, there, we're in the entertainment business. So holidays, we work, we work mother's day, we work, the only days we get off is Easter, you know, because it's the Lord's Day or whatever. And, you know, we get Super Bowl Sunday off because whatever that makes sense, you know. <laughs> we don't get either of those. Uh, we get Christmas Cause, Day. And cause it, it, you're right, because in 07, when I set the record, I had three days off. Easter Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday, and Christmas. I took three days off that whole year when I was racing. Did you enjoy that Did you, or were you just caught up in the moment? But yeah, I was, I mean, I love winning, you know, and at that time I was young and trying to stay hungry and, you know, trying to make a name for myself. I just moved to the East coast and, uh, you know, they, when, when they start falling in, it's not hard, you know, you're winning six, seven a day and, 
you know, I'm driving 20, 30 a day, but you know, it was just fun. And I was on that roll. So I just kept it going. You're still, you're going to answer this. Yes. But do you still have that competitive urge like you did back then to me? Um, you know, oh, I want to win. I want to win. I don't like going out there to practice. I want to win. And I, I'm my worst critic. Cause I, every time I get beat, I'm like, I could have done this better. It's my fault. No matter if the horse broke a hobble or what, I still like, I should have held that hobble together and I would have still win, you know, you know, I'm a, I'm a sore loser. Always have been. <laughs> I'd like to see you try, try to do that. What, and what I meant by that, I mean, that might sound funny, but when you were back in 2007, you need more than just that competitive edge because you've got to get out of bed every day and Groundhog Day, basically go to the races, meet the same people and try and enjoy it and try and reach a, a target. And it, it can take a lot out of you. Um, obviously it did, you know, again, but I was 27, 28 years old. I was back home. It actually was less work when I first come out here because I had a 30 horse stable in Illinois. You know, I was running that racing seven days a week in Chicago, 10, 12 races a night and getting up in the morning and training a 30 horse stable. So it, when I come out here, I had no horse to do in the morning. So I got to sleep till 1030, go to the track and go to work and be done whatever time. So honestly, at that time, it was less work. You know, I was racing every day, but at home, you know how it is when you have a 30 horse stable, you still got to get up and feed on Sunday and you got to take care of them. You got to go to the barn. And when you're, you're in the lead guy, you got to take care of it. So it, yeah, here, I didn't have any mouths to feed. It was being by myself. I was living in a hotel and cause I didn't have any family out this way. I moved out. I was living out of my truck and you know, so it wasn't all that bad. Yeah. It sounds, it sort of sounds fun, but I, that's part of your life as well. So uh, a lot of young blokes would be saying, I, would, I don't want to do it again. I don't want to do it again. Uh, but you know, it got my name out there and cause I went all over everywhere up these up down the East coast. I went everywhere, whether it was New York, Buffalo, Pocono, Pennsylvania, Delaware, I was racing somewhere every day and traveling, getting there. But. Do you learn by your mistakes? Like if you, is there things that you learned back then you, you still look back at me and say, I'm never doing that again. Oh, the, the travel part was a lot. I put 170,000 on the car that year. There's a lot of miles. <laughs> that uh, nearly beats Chris Alfred. So, yeah, so he's, he's trying to pop. I can't to beat the wee man. The wee man's the best. He's my idol. I can't beat the wee man. He hopefully he doesn't watch this because he'll get a big head now and we'll be in all sorts of trouble. But he yeah, deserves great... it, man. He deserves it. I love that guy. He's a he's a champ in my eyes. you got a great friendship with him, though. And, uh, and that he is the best. Pretty... There's plenty of other Aussies over there too at the minute, which um be a bit unique. Yeah, you can take them back, man. Ever since they've got here, we've had pay cups for everybody. So take them <laughs> back, you know. Now I hear uh, you know, Luke's coming and Toddy's here, he's unbelievable. Andrew's great, he's my next door neighbor, and you know, those guys are so talented. They're first one to congratulate you if you do beat them, but man, it's hard to beat those guys. They're so good at what they do. Yeah, it's exciting. Luke's got I think five or six horses. Might be in quarantine right now. They flew out. I actually know that for sure because my brother flew them. So um, yeah, just already... more pay cuts for us. That's all. Us <laughs> Americans got more pay cuts coming. But at least he's bringing the horses, and you don't mind the Australian horses either. You did have a, a little, a nice relationship with a little horse called Char Tim. That wasn't a pay cut for you. Yeah, no, she was great. You know, we had to buy her to get her over here. Thank God, American owners bought her. But you know, like Luke's got two brothers. He ain't gonna list this red. He's not gonna put me on him when he's got the two redhead. I mean, Luke and Toddy there. You know, so yeah. But he's already been over there a few times. So, I mean, you obviously know what he's capable of. Luke. Oh, he's a great guy. Great. The whole family, McCarthy family. They're, um, you know, their their mother and father are one of my favorite peoples. When I went over to visit in Sydney, they come and got me, show me around to their farm. I went hang out with Luke. Um, you know, and Toddy and Andrew both over here are just. You could just tell they were raised right. They're a very, very good family. What does it mean when they come over there? Because there's plenty of Aussies try to come across there. There's heaps of young grooms over there too at the minute. A couple working for Nancy. Um, uh, Brad Chisholm's over there as well. I think he even drove a winner the other day. Do you guys embrace that? Like, I mean, and, and is it something that probably affects, maybe not yourself, but people a little bit down the pecking order, if you like, in the driving ranks when these Aussies come across? Well, I mean talent will show up you know that, that's one thing about it. if you have talent they're going to use you you know and there's plenty of opportunity to get started over here because we race a lot you know there's a lot of tracks to show up to and if you want to go to work and you can make things happen so um you know those guys are just really good at what they do and they have backing noel daly's here they've helped andrew and toddy both out and noel's got a huge stable and it's a it's a top-notch stable um you know nifty nifty norman and he i know he's new zealand but 
you know, he's got connections and, you know, those guys are just great horsemen, you know, and if you can, and Brett Pelling, you know, of course, you know, Brett's a great guy and great trainer. And, you know, when you can uh, drive for those guys come stake season, your name's going to get called because they're really top of the game trainers. You know? Yeah. And we forgot about Dexter Dunn. Of course, I know he's a Kiwi, but. Um, no, yeah. we, we didn't forget about him. I'm just trying to forget about him. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> he, he looks like a bit you of a can serial. Take him, you, you can take him back too. Go ahead. <laughs> he looks like a serial pest. A couple of I, I was doing a, a video thing. Um, I think it was for King of the North for Calf McIntosh, and I was watching the lead up to it. And he was behind the boys on Costa TV. Dexter was, and poor old Yannick Ginga, he gave him buggery. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're all all the guys are great to work with. They're good to drive with. They're safe. Um, they're hard to beat. Like I've said a million times, but. You know, everybody wants to go home. They're not taking huge chances. They're taking chances, but they have, they want all the people to go home. You know, they want you to win. If they can't win, they want you to. So, yeah. at the end of the day, that's all you can ask for. No, nah, and it looks look it looks a lot of fun. And uh, you know, so young Jet uh, Turnbull, I was talking to about him um, driving his hundredth winner um, earlier on. He was over there um, earlier this or later last year, I suppose it was at, at the end of your around jug time, right? He was he was yeah. around jug time. Yep, I met him. He's an awesome little kid. Yep. It was interesting talking to him. I got an interview with him, and I said, "You know, do you inspire to go to America?" And and I don't know if it was yourself or Yannick or someone spoke to him and just said, "You know, um, he's too young for America." Like, and you know, and have to be. He said it sort of works differently over here, where the young guys get a real good chance. But he said over there, you sort of got to be around that twenty-five, thirty mark before you'll really start to get drives. Not if you're good enough. You know, if you're good enough, you can fall in the right place. And if you've got the right trainer backing you, you know, if he come over here and had, you know, Nifty or uh, Brett Pelling put him on everything, the kid's going to look great. The kid's got talent. You know, maybe some of the seasoning part, you know, the tricks yep. to trade, like when it comes down to, you know, the big races where you, you can't be too aggressive, but you got to be super aggressive, little things that you learn. Um, but if he's good, he's going to learn really quick. You know, that's, yep. that's what I learned really quick, you know, the, don't make the same mistake twice. You know, that's that's what I always try to learn. No, hopefully he stays here. He's a great advert for Australian racing. And uh, I'm sure and he's, he's 19, right? He's 19, right? No, he's 19. 16. 16. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's ridic- it is actually ridiculous. He's already driven 100 winners. And um, yeah, I know in America that might be a bit different, but it's just amazing over here. No, it's great. It's absolutely yeah. wonderful. Yeah, it is indeed. Yeah. Um, Last season, you say about the Aussies and that probably the year before, um, they stole a lot of the limelight, getting on a lot of the better horses. Last year for yourself, um, you paired up with some really top line horses. It must have been a good year for you last year, just for yourself, I would imagine. No, a great year. Um, you know, I had, I think, three or four divisional winners by the end of the year. Um, ended up getting to drive a horse a year, Confederate. You know, so, um, yeah, I had a great year. I mean, I always want more, you know, but that's just me and um you know by the end of the year i don't really start with a lot of the big stables i get a couple really good quality um trainers that give me a lot of respect and give me horses to drive to start out and then you know the year just kind of rolled into a good one you know i had a great year Uh, i think i was second in money so it was good how does it how does it work um in that sense like once you get on a on a horse like confederate is it your drive and no one else asks for it or or are people always trying to, you know, white answer, trying to get the get the drive off you? Well, I'm, I'm sure they're trying. I mean, yeah, I I was lucky enough to drive him as a two year old. Uh, Brian Brown trained him at two, and uh, every year Brian gives me two or three that Pennsylvania breads, and you know nobody knows how good they are when they baby race them. And uh, I baby raced this horse, and he was okay. And you know by the end of the year he was top of the class, you know, and then he only got better coming back at three. And, um, you know, everything just worked out, you know, but I did drive his whole two-year-old year, except maybe one race when I had conflicting other races where I couldn't drive him, but he was Kentucky Sire State champion for 400, second in the Breeders' Crown at two, and then, you know, things went, you know, everybody knows what he did last year as a three-year-old. Cannibal was possibly a better two-year-old than him as in their two-year-old years, but Confederate just no, turned no, no, I don't think he ever beat him. No, I don't think he ever beat uh, Confederate two-year-old. Not okay. that I remember, you know, I was second the British Crown when the Kentucky Sire Stakes, and I don't think Can- Cannibal even raced that much at two, maybe just in a few overnights, but I don't remember him winning a stake race. 
Yeah. Was he always something special? Like, do you remember, or was there a, a race? Yeah. Where yeah. From day one, he could just he could he could sprint. You know, at at first he wasn't a very big horse, and he never was a very big horse, but he could just sprint so fast. And at two, you know, uh, Bryson just take care of him, just you know, race him off the pace, and we did. And I don't think I ever put him on the lead except maybe one time in Lexington um, during Grand Circuit. He jogged around there in fifty one, but you know, he could just pace home in twenty five seconds anytime he wanted him to. So as long as I was second, third over, I could win the race. So it was always a easy horse to drive. That was one thing that was very unique for him, wasn't it? Compared to a lot of the other American horses had to nearly be in front, like 400 from home. Um, he could be a length or two off them and be able to still pick them up. Well, at, at this day of racing, and uh, he's like a horse that would have raced 20 years ago with styles. You know, he, he could just overcome the bias. You know, now if you're not aggressive and in control of the races in America, you don't win the race. You know, unless they just go stupid, stupid numbers and, you know, I could be lay off the off the lead and they could go even go too slow and he would just overcome it. You know, it, yeah. he was just that good. It wouldn't it wouldn't worry him in, in, in any way. And it didn't worry me. I got I could yeah. sit back there and somebody could steal a quarter and I could still be like, I got you. I got it's over whenever I want to, you know. It must have been fun. Oh, it's great. It was like the, he was easiest best horse I ever drove for as a driver because it wasn't too much stress. It was easy. You know, you didn't have to be super aggressive and just be close, turn for home, and you still had a great shot. Did you do you get pressure on a horse like him? Obviously, what he's a stayer now, standing his first season in America, going to stand his first season in Australia. Do you get pressure from Diamond Creek or other owners to you know continually try to win, or um, you don't feel that outside pressure? Eh, it's not my job to feel the pressure. We do, but it's not my job. Uh, my job is go out there and take care of the horse for one, make sure the horse tries to make the Breeders' Crown because you got to qualify him in May, and the Breeders' Crowns are not till end of October. Everybody tells you you want to win the Breeders' Crown. That's the most important race, which they're all important. But so you got to, there's a fine line you got to walk, you know. So for me, me, I always try to manage them to try to make as much as I can without killing them and have that horse around for the end of the year. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's actually pretty pretty cool to, to know that like in May that's when you want the horse up and up and going well, I mean the big races pay a lot of money and you know I, I was never a big qualifying guy I could care less where they finish in qualifiers and, you know but uh, when the money's down it I, I like the horses to be at the wire first a horse like him got retired retired early does that does that worry you it sucks no because I wanted to come back and race you know like you know, I, I now Diamond Creek, Adam Bowden, they were nice enough to give me a breeding for that horse, but um, he was so much fun to race. You know, like sometimes money's not everything. And it's those those champions like he is, is so hard to find. And he was so much fun to drive. You know, just he was a, he, he gave me chills every time I got to race him. But you must understand why they wanted to retire him too, I suppose. Oh, it's, it's the right thing. I get it. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of money, you know, but. You know, hopefully they find more that can do what he can do and they don't have that void of having that great racehorse but um you know i i get it i get both sides me i'm just being greedy i want to race the horse you know but i'm glad he's getting a second career being a stallion too yeah no it's it's uh very very exciting uh little philly geocentric another sweet lou uh do you like the sweet loose love i mean love him yeah love him yeah of course, you would over the year. Uh, she's back. I think she went to the qualifiers last week or the week before um, and qualified. Yeah, two weeks. I think two weeks ago, my little brother qualified her at Hoosier Park for me, uh, for Brian. And um, all systems seemed go. She got home 26 both times. And I watched the replays. I, I, I couldn't be there. It's too far for me to go. But she makes her first start Friday at, at the Meadows. I uh, drew the rail on a sire stake. So all systems should be go. Like, she's, uh, she's a great filly. She really is. She's big. She's strong. Um, got high, high speed. She didn't end the year good last year with the British crown, but there were some excuses. And, you know, um, I spoke with Brian before she qualified, after she qualified. And, you know, they said she just seems like she's a great one. So what do you, um, what have you got to look forward to baby wise coming through? Uh, three-year-olds. Yeah. Um, I got geocentric, which was a division winner. 
Uh, Sori Hanover for Lucas Wallen. She was uh, a really nice trot in Philly last year that made almost 700,000. Second, the Breeders' Crown got beat a nose. Um, great, big, strong Philly, little green. Um, if she could grow up a little bit mentally, you know, she could do anything. She could she could be a 49 trotter if she grows up mentally. And, you know, a lot of young horses. So hopefully, um, hopefully it'll all work out. Have you been driving school and babies? Have you been out doing that yet? Is that something that I, happens? I just my own. I have two homebreds of my own. I go down to Jimmy King's, which trained Sharton when she was here. Um, he's got, I think, 10 or 12 two-year-olds that I've gone down there and trained a few times. Yeah, and so you just wait. Like, it's interesting just to understand how it works. You just sort of wait till they start getting to the races and then so you can get aligned with. Well, I, like come baby race time, I, I'll get a listed on a few, like Lucas Wallen. Um, Jimmy King, he's got 10 or 12 and there'll be people that put me up and, you know, some of the best ones I ever picked up were just, you know, for a guy next door, you know, that worked out. So you know, hopefully it, uh, it'll work out again for me. You get excited this time of year when you know all the good racing's in touching distance. You've gone for a cold. Absolutely. Week. You know, yeah. Besides the, uh, getting really, really busy with no days off. Yeah. But getting to compete with the high horses is, it's great. Yeah, it sounds like an awesome time. Timmy, thank you. I like to try and, as I said, break down the barriers. I wouldn't mind catching up with you maybe later in the season or something like that, especially if a couple of these horses are low flying and go from there as well. But thank you for joining me, mate. I appreciate it. As I say, I want people to start watching um, international racing um, and hopefully the internationals might start watching us as well, but try and break down some of these barriers and promote the industry um, out there, which uh, yourself and your wife do outstandingly. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. I appreciate it. Mr. Campbell, you called me sir earlier as well. I'll have to stop both of those, but thank you very much, mate. All right, Bob. Have a good night.